Hello and welcome to Fintech Focus TV. My name's Ian Bailey and we're here at day two in a fantastic Pay360 event at the Excel Centre in East London. Uh, I'm joined now by Rory Tanner from Revolut. Rory? Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, very good. Thank you, thank you so much for, for coming and, and, and seeing with us. Um, let's start with an introduction. Tell us about you, tell us about your role at Revolut. Sure, so I'm Rory Tanner. I'm Head of UK Government Affairs and Public Policy at Revolut. So what that means is essentially two roles. Firstly, I manage our relationships with the UK government, with certain uh, regulators, industry. And then Head of Policy means I'm uh, responsible for all UK uh, future policy policy and regulation, uh, developing our positions, seeking internal uh, agreement, and then going out and achieving those. So it's kind of a dual of lobbying plus policy. Well, and a pretty sizable role, I would imagine. That's, tell me, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's good. <laughs> and you were here today this afternoon doing a panel, right? Like, yes, yeah, so hence why my voice is a bit hoarse. There's a lot of speaking. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we did a panel on how to balance innovation with regulation and is there too much going on at, uh, at the moment? The age-old battle. Like, what were the any key takeaways? Well, obviously, my points were the best. Of course, that's uh, right. goes without saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a really good panel, clear back myself and others. Yeah. Very aligned. I think um, you know, from an incumbent banking point of view and fintech, there's probably a a worry that there's too much going on. There's regulation for fraud, there's considerations of the future of open banking, thinking about open finance, looking at stable coins and CBDCs. There's almost so much going on that it's hard to focus on one thing and I think when we're considering the future of payments there's a debate of should we be picking one and running at it yeah. or do we facilitate everything and let a winner emerge and there's pitfalls for both right because firstly who is the one picking say we go let's right be the best at open banking, which is essentially what we've done so far. Are we discriminating against stable coins or CBDCs? Or if we let everyone decide, then we're developing four or five things at once and diluting focus when maybe actually, if we don't focus our attention on open banking, for example, yeah. we won't become the world leader. You know, we'll lose that position to Sweden or Germany or whatever. So yeah, a lot of kind of complex discussions and then considering the political situation. So is a future government going to view the future of payments differently to this one? And yeah, very interesting. But I'm a policy nerd, so I would find it interesting right. for the person on the street, maybe not, not so bad. Well, it's, it affects everybody, right? So sure. like, it's, it's a free and, and it being such a huge subject, I mean, what is in store? What's, what's next in the regulatory landscape? So I think the biggest one uh, has seemed to be the focus of the main discussion today has been the incoming APB fraud regime. Okay. So that's coming in October 2024, and it's a uh, you know, massive step change whereby all PSBs, and so not just banks or big firms, every single payment firm in the UK will be responsible for reimbursing customers that are victim to APB fraud. So there's going to be a massive change on the risk profile of payments, on the level of intervention and friction that payment firms will have to, to provide. And last week, Treasury introduced legislation to enable the slowing down of payments, so the delay of payments from one day to, to four or five days. You know, a lot of probably what you've been talking about and everyone here is about seamless payments, oh, yeah. increasing the Speeding speed. Things up, and yeah. actually, we're now making a deliberate effort to slow payments down because there's an acceptance of the risk profile of payments now. So, um, yeah, it's a really interesting one. And I think we can cautiously welcome slowing down payments because it gives us more time to investigate potentially fraudulent payments. But what is the unintended consequence of that on productivity yeah, right. on all of the firms here today that are competing and probably offering a usp by being faster than others you know how are we supposed to communicate this to customers who are going to be frustrated what are the impacts on larger payments like house deposits which rely on same day payments you know there's a lot of unintended consequences and i think that we're still in the infancy of having these discussions okay. and maybe arguably not really figured it out yet how we're going to maintain international competitiveness in payments while balancing that out with 
understanding and reducing the risk profile of fraud and fraudulent payments. And what, what is the, the key factor within that? Is, it, is that technology, technical limitations with, with balancing it? Um, yes, yeah, but well, I think partially the reason why I think Treasury has acted is because they recognize the increasing risk of fraud. Yeah. AI plays a massive role in that. Just think about it. If you've got generative AI, you can use chatbots to target 10,000 people, not 100 people. So right. maybe instead of one in 100 people being uh, defrauded, it's 10 in 10,000. Yeah. So you're actually 10xing everything, yeah. even though maybe the success rate goes down because they're not as convincing, but you're actually leading to more people being more defrauded. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's an acceptance that you're putting the entire liability risk on payment firms rather than sharing that with the enablers of the fraud. So what we say is that people aren't defrauded on a payment platform, they're defrauded likely on social media or over the phone. Right. The transactions take place through the, pl the provider. Yeah. So there's an acceptance that firms should play a role in firstly preventing the fraud and maybe reimbursing it. But the alternative is that the firm that enables the fraud should be contributing firstly to the fight to prevent fraud, but if they enable that, then they should be sharing the liability. Yeah. And I think that you broadly see that as a polluter pays policy. And if you think about other sectors where you apply that rule, that is how you actually reduce fraud or reduce the toxin or toxic thing yeah. that is coming from that. Yeah. And we would apply that, that you're not going to reduce fraud by increasing reimbursement. You're only going to reduce fraud if you get meta and mobile operators to take that issue as seriously as we yeah, do yeah. and incentivize to prevent it. Fascinating. I mean, look, no shortage of challenges by the sound of things. So what can Revolut do? How are Revolut helping? Well, I think as a starter, we do a lot to help our customers in the fight against fraud. Um, we have over 4,000 staff that are in our thin crime team, which accounts wow. about over 50% of our global workforce. So again, that shows the very real Take human element and yeah. the investment that yeah. we put in. Secondly, we deploy very, very sophisticated AI technology to fight against fraud. We say AI to fight against AI, because ultimately it's an arms race, uh, a technological arms race. We have over 500 million transactions a month that we feed into our advanced machine learning algorithm to, to fight fraud. So there's that part of what we do to protect our customers. And I think that ultimately having these conversations and what I do, which is talk to government, to regulators, to industry, yeah. to look for pragmatic solutions. I think that I'm coming here today saying that we accept that we have a role to play in reimbursement. We're not saying that this is not our problem. We're saying that we accept that we have a role to play. But if you're not involving all stakeholders in the fight against fraud, and that's not just reimbursement, that's data sharing, that's education of customers. You know, we need to have a holistic view of fraud that involves law enforcement, government, financial services institutions, yeah. and these other firms, technology firms, telecoms, because that is how you're going to fight fraud. And the line that we like to say is financial institutions should be the last line of defense against fraud, not the only line of defense. Yeah. Yeah, as you say, and it's down to the likes of Meta and, and to, to take that responsibility. Yeah, exactly. I think like, we'd published data that said that they account for 60% of all fraud in the UK. Oh, yeah. So we're not singling them out for any reason. It's because they actually enable the majority of yeah. fraud in the UK. Again, what we're trying to do is publish that data and we might encourage other firms to say, this is not just a revenue problem, this is an industry problem. Yeah. When we talk to the incumbent banks, I can name check TSB and Santander purely because they gave evidence alongside us at the Home Affairs Select Committee and said the same thing. You talk privately to any incumbent bank and any fintech and they will say the same thing, yeah. uh, that you know there are clear outliers in the data and therefore it means that they're not currently doing enough and that maybe there is more that needs to be done to bring them to the table. Yeah. It's a fascinating subject. And, and just finally, if any viewers want to find out more about this or any resources or anything like that, where should they go? What should they do? Um, UK Finance and Innovate Finance and the EMA and the Payments Association. Yeah. I would say like just follow their LinkedIn pages, you know, like they have a role to communicate what they're doing to their members and to others. And a lot of the time there's some really interesting stuff. If you want to get deeper, I'm sure there's lots of policy papers that they also publish if you want to get yeah. to the details. And obviously follow me on LinkedIn as the most important thing. Of course. For Rory Tanner, LinkedIn. <laughs> Rory, look, thanks ever so much for your time. It's been really great. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you.